to. In lesson one, we kind of covered over basic sort of querying of data, filtering, uh, displaying, if you already have the data in Databricks. What we're gonna be looking at today is how do you actually get data in Databricks and how do you kind of like read from other resources? Um, what we have in these labs is that the data is already loaded into Databricks and stored in there which isn't typically what you'd have. You kind of, we use Databricks to sit as like a sort of transform layer. So we grab the data from Data Lake, which is Microsoft's uh, fancy storage system. And then we sort of do some work on it and either put it back in Lake or put it somewhere else uh, for, for the next step of the process. So how do we interact with, uh, with those other resources? So uh, notebooks are in sort of same format. We're gonna work through some practices uh, with the answers and then have a practice question at the end that the client might ask us. To start off then, uh, I'm going to clear down the notebook from previous runs. And I'm going to run this framework base, which I'm going to come back and cover. Um, but for now, let's just move on to the next task. We're going to skip all of that. We are going to read from Key Vault. So to do all of your service connections to other resources, you're going to need credentials to get into them. You're going to need uh, the kind of like access links, things like that. And it is not a good idea to actually have those hard coded in Databricks just because Databricks access is a bit more lenient than other resources. Anyone who gets in there would be able to read then uh, those credentials and then potentially able to access those resources as well. So we want to eliminate that, keep everything in a key vault, uh, Databricks does its own sort of protection on those keys, which we'll show you. Um, and I'm just going to show you then how to connect up to Databricks initially. So if I was to click up here, top left on Databricks, it takes me to my homepage here of Databricks. And you can see here, this big long number is my Databricks instance. And so if I was to do this Databricks instance and then look in documentation, stick secrets slash create scope at the end, I'm going to get this page and what this page is asking me to do is create that kind of key vault connection. So scope name is not necessarily the name of the key vault, but it's the name you're going to refer to that key vault as in Databricks, right? And then you actually stick in some of the, the, the parameters that will allow you to connect to key vault below it. I've already gone ahead and done this um, and I've just called it key gap vault. So in our opening question, we're being asked to grab a secret from Key Vault. And I will flash up the Key Vault here. Oh, I'll flash up the Key Vault here. Um, nothing too crazy about this. There is a secret here called Notebook Path, which we're going to be grabbing. And I will happily show you the secret because it's just a folder path um, for AAS. Uh, lookup.csv. So that's the secret that we're going to be grabbing. And we are basically being asked to use this dbutil secret get, I'm going to copy all of that, get scope key vault. Um, key vault is the scope name for the key vault. So the value you put in here. So this will be unique to your environment. And then secret is the name of the secret we're grabbing. And in my case, it's called notebook path. So if I go ahead and run that, it's done something, commands run. Um, why don't we have a look, see if we actually collected it. Let's do this, run notebook path, run that, redacted. So this is basically Databricks protecting that secret. And I'll just show you that. Uh, this isn't just that function, right? If you print hello, it prints hello. But um, yeah, it's, it's Databricks protecting that secret, so you can't go into Databricks and basically just read out all of the sort of like bypass the key vault and read everything out. It will it will mask that secret. So it's still got it um, so it's stored away in its in its container, but um, you just basically can't print it out and see it. There are ways around it. I'm not going to share them with you on this video. Uh, if you do want to know, you can Google it. Check we got that correctly. Yes, we read in a secret called Notebook Path. Pretty straightforward, good stuff. So moving on. I want to read some files in from the data lake. Why did we run those framework notebooks at the start? Let's go back to them. So to connect to other resources, you need to define things like the, the DNS, the client ID, the directory ID, secrets to get in. It's a bit laborious. So 
I don't want to have to write this big chunk of stuff every time I want to grab a file, a file, right? What if I want to grab loads of them? I can't be writing that loads of times. So what we do is we have framework notebooks um, that perform kind of just uh, the basic stuff that allows you to just get a, get up and going coding, right? So it installs libraries, uh, it does basic functions for you, and it also sets up a load of service connections. So if we have a look at one of these framework notebooks, um, here's a connection to a data lake. We're basically grabbing client ID, client secrets, directory ID, uh, appending the URL to basically go and take from that, um, that uh, data lake. And through some other code, we're storing it all basically as data lake source. So if I ever call data lake source, it will do all of the hard work to connect to all of that data lake for me. And then I can literally just say data lake source plus file name, and I should be able to grab that file. And that is actually what we are going to have a go at doing. So as with the other stuff, if I try and print data lake source, going to get a redacted, and that's because it's using key values, right? It's, it's masking them, it's hiding them. So done with that. What I want to do is grab a data frame. Uh, just calling it jobs df, probably just grab this code from one of the other lessons. What we're saying is we want to grab a file, uh, my data lake and my folder, or this is like the main container, and then this is like the folder path to it, right? Now, what we spent all of above doing is defining data lake source. So rather than have all of those connections and options and whatever, I can just stick in data lake source. And then the file path conveniently, funny we were using one earlier, I'm going to give that a go here. Oh, that is not what I wanted. So I'm basically saying, go and get me a CSV from my data lake, from that file path. Let me know what the file path is, uh, which is there. And I'll actually show you that file. So here we are in, uh, in AAS, and then it was lookup.csv. So it is this file here, which is in this folder, which is in this uh, container. Okay. And what I also do is stick in a jobs df dot display. Let's just check that that file is actually pulling out something. So if we go ahead and read that, cool. Here's some data. You'll notice that the column headers aren't where they should be. I haven't put any options in, like give me column header, this, that, and this. I'm not interested in that, just showing you that I can read from data lake. Awesome. Looks like that was all we were asking to do. Um, going to brush over this one, but not actually perform it. So SQL Server, you can also connect directly to that. Um, it's not very performant, so I don't generally do it. Tend to, uh, and also just people are doing things in SQL and they don't know if it's connecting, connections get cut, whatever. It's nicer just to have it in a, a lake. It's easier to read, quicker access, stuff like that. You can, however, connect. Um, basically using this option. So that's the URL of the SQL Server, the table of view that you want to take, and it'll take the full thing, um, username and password. So you'll need that SQL username and password to get in. Can't use like an MFA account. It will have to be like a service account, something like that. But possible can be done. All right, so we're going to look at parameters now. So Databricks is especially useful for kind of like transformation of data. So we use it. Um, during our loads to basically do that first layer of cleansing on the data. Now we're ingesting, you know, upwards of a couple of hundred tables sometimes, and I don't want to have to write a notebook for every single table to, uh, and then write out all of the columns and things like that, right? So what we want to use is parameters so that we can use one notebook and then we can pass in those different notebook, uh, different table names every time it's run. So what this looks like now, look up top here, there's nothing here at the moment. When I run this cell, suddenly 
queued locations appeared, and this is the value inside it. So this is a parameter. Um, I've basically defined the parameter queued location AAS lookup, right, which is the folder we're going into. And then I'm saying that my, sorry, then I'm saying my parameter is equal to this kind of like external parameter up here. Now this external parameter up here is special because this can be manipulated by whatever's feeding into the notebook. So if I had this being called by data factory, data factory can loop through those 150 tables that it gets in a list. And every time it loops, it can pass in one of those names. So I could have my folder where I've ingested all of those table names and then every single table name being passed in one by one. And then because I've set my parameter equal to my kind of like external parameter, this is now called in the code every time it, within that notebook during that run, it's going to use that table name as the parameter. Um, we're being asked to make a, another parameter called queued name. Uh, this is going to be the actual file name. So I'm going to steal pretty much all of that code and then just change name here. In fact, let's just make sure that these are the same. OK, and um, we don't want this value here. And I'll tell you what, I'll show you something while we're here. Uh, if I run this, comes in blank. And if I then fill this up with a value, just some random letters, you'll see it still says blank. So on that first definition is kind of when it defines it. And this value here isn't actually this value here. It's equal to whatever's in here. So what I'm going to do is manually type this in. And even though it says this here, my queued name should be equal to that lookup.csv2. Um, we have this just in case you make mistakes, just because it's a bit fiddly. And if you want to get rid of them or you made the parameter name wrong or something like that, you can run this and it'll just wipe both of them off. Um, and then you can start again. So run these two in. I've got my two parameters. You can probably see where this is going. Check that we've got that right. Yeah, probably see where this is going. So I've left the answer in here. Whoops. But basically what we're being asked is, can we now load in a CSV file from the data lake using both our parameters? So kind of like how this interactive notebook will be run in the morning, we would pass in a folder name, we pass in all of our table names, and we pass in our data lake name. So um, how do we do that? So yeah, as you might have just seen the answer flashed up, uh, we are going to use the word practice as our data frame, not with all those extras. Um, I'm going to read in a CSV, I think it is. Yeah, it is. Look up to CSV. So let's read in a CSV. And then it's going to ask me basically for how do I get to that CSV? I'm going to steal data lake source. So data lake source to connect to the data lake. We are going to add a parameter to give it some further description, just writing to the data lake and saying, give me a file, won't return anything at the moment. If I was to, if I was to just run that, it would give me every CSV file that's in this location. Um, sometimes that's a useful function to have if they're all the same structure and all the same, if it does it sort of like, uh, in uh, if, in different parts, but if they're completely different files, then you don't want to do that because it will just say we can't like append them together um, or give you some weird result. So at current, this is going to read into my data lake source, it's going to read into the AAS folder, the lookup folder, um, AAS folder, lookup folder. And we have two files in here. We've got lookup and we've got lookup CSV2. So I don't want lookup, I want lookup CSV2. So all I'm going to do, add another plus, add my final parameter in there. And if we run this in display, there we go. So it's read in that file. Again, not bothered about promoting the headers to where they should be. 
but yeah we've got those files and if we just check yeah same as the answer okay so that's kind of it of how you can interact with sources especially from reading in data anyway um generally if things have an api call databricks can read them in it's quite malleable in that way um vice versa if saying things have like kind of push APIs or upload APIs, again, Databricks can deal with that and you can push data. Um, in a later lesson, we'll cover kind of how to save those files back to the lake uh, once we've done some work on them and then other parts of the process can use them. But for now, yeah, that was it, just uh, reading in data. Hopefully this has been helpful and uh, let's see you on lesson three.